Well, good evening, and welcome to Lecture 6 as we go through our series in historical theology. Uh, again, we kind of started from the beginning, looking at the, from the New Testament times, uh, not so much in the New Testament, but the early apostolic fathers, and we're working our way up. Uh, again, if you look at the slide on the screen, uh, the course objectives are to kind of work that way from the early church up to the modern era. I don't know if I'll get to it in this series. Um, that is ultimately what I've have kind of written. I mean, so far in my in my writing of the, of the material, I'm pretty much in the Reformation time, uh, but that's going to be probably for a different section. But um, yeah, so again, thanks for thanks for coming back out um, or tuning in or listening online. Obviously, you can't really come back out because it's in my studio or in my study. So anyway, so yeah, so this time we are going to be looking at, oops, make a little correction here. We're going to be looking at the early church theologian, Origen. <clears throat> now, Origen is kind of a, um, he's either hated or he's loved. Uh, I think, and unfortunately, as, well, as I'll mention later on, I think, I want to say he probably got a bit of a bad, a bad rap, but uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, as we go through this, we cannot, we don't want to, you know, hold uh, the early church fathers to a, a standard of orthodoxy that we have uh, affirmed now. And what I mean is, you know, we have a body of knowledge to stand on. We have, you know, 18, 1900 years of, of theological development, uh, working through all the various nuances and and various kind of counter counterpoints. And just as we develop the theology that we have now, and these guys didn't have it, he didn't have it. So uh, it's important to, to keep that in mind. Um, again, he's a very, very uh, uh, well-known theologian. Uh, I think Unfortunately, again, a lot, a lot of the, the dubiousness uh, ha, of those have have talked about him, haven't liked him. But I think there's been a lot more attention on him lately due to a kind of a resurgence in patristic scholarship. To where, when there was theologians that were expressing their concerns with Origen or how he was um, a heretic, um, again, there were some very aberrant views there. But a lot of them were, were guys that were systematic theologians. They weren't patristic writers they weren't alexandrian scholars they weren't guys that really kind of um you know kind of embedded themselves in the theology of origin or in the theology of somebody else that kind of less would take kind of some statements that a lot of times kind of came up through through controversy um and became what they would say that the theologian embodied as a whole now obviously there's times like especially you see in augustine he has his his later stuff his recantations of, of things that he thought in and taught earlier in his life, and he matured, and, and that kind of thing. So, but again, uh, this is uh, definitely a, a, a early church father that we want to take serious. Um, what we'll be going through today tonight is not a whole lot. Um, it's um, uh, I think it's something to kind of get your your palate wet on him, and I recommend definitely uh, even just you know reading some of his work. So, but we'll get started. So, <clears throat> so Origen, as you can see on the screen, he lived during one, around 185 to 254. He was born of a Christian family. He was trained in both secular and religious literature. Uh, his range of learning was vast, and he is considered one of the greatest of the early Christian thinkers, whose work is still very influential and, as I said, is very controversial today. Uh, in his uh, first principles, which is the book that we're going to kind of be gleaning some stuff through, and I'll show you the, the picture of the book at the end, um, here he begins his discussion on God. And again, obviously, we're focusing on Doctrine of God and the Trinity, right? So these are the very early phases of this stuff. So, uh, but he begins his discussion on God as to whether he has a body. Uh, since scripture speaks of God as light and a consuming fire, and so that's something he's definitely kind of trying to figure out. So God is a consuming fire, as scripture says. However, um, we are not to understand such designations literally speaking, right? God is not literally a burning fire. God is not literally light, right? These are terms that are using to really speak of the, uh, of the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hold on, let me, let me drink, take a drink real quick. I guess the, the holiness, the, the reverence, the majesty, the, the awesomeness of God, these terms scripture uses help kind of paint a picture for us in, in, in ways that we can not so much analogically say, but um, kind of give us an idea of of, of God's, um, not a, not his immensity. There's a word I'm looking for, and some reason it escapes me, but if it comes back, I will share it. But, um, but God doesn't consume bodily matter, wood, hay, or stubble, right? We know that scripture from scripture from 1 Corinthians 3, 
And that's what ultimately he, he talks about here is that, and I don't think I have it here, but somewhere else that's um, Origen is very uh, intrigued by the fact that um, God is a you know burning bush, but he does not consume, right? He doesn't consume the wood. He continues to burn. So how does that, if that's truly a fire, how does it not burn wood? And what he does later on, um, again, I don't think it's in here. I don't recall being in here, but later on, he actually kind of uses that analogy of the burning bush to speak of the hypostatic union about how how god the son can take on flesh and inhabit it but not really consume it or be a part of it in a material in a material way so that's kind of kind of interesting so that's that's a free thought there for you but anyways um again get back to origin so he speaking of god consumes evil thoughts wicked actions and the desires for sin in those whom the Father and the Son make their abode. The Spirit is not a being that can be divided into bodily parts or be uh, partaken by each one of the saints. Now again, we are talking about divine simplicity. Uh, God is, in his essence, one, right? There is no parts of God. Um, even though he's three in one, there's no separate, distinct parts of God. So the Spirit is not separate, the Son is not separate, and the Father is not separate. Uh, Origen says the spirit is an intellectual being subsisting, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and subsists and exists distinctly. Okay, so subsistence is a word, or subs yeah, there subsists or subsistence. It refers to a being whose essence naturally requires it to exist in itself. Okay, it, it exists essentially of its own identity. So I am a subsistence of, of myself, of Brian, right? I am a I exist of, of myself, and so I say that Brian is in the subsistence of this body, right? It's my identity. And so when you hear that subsistence or subsist, that's kind of what it means. And the point is we're talking about the divine Godhead. We're saying, now back to his point, about the, the intellectual being of the spirit subsists and exists distinctly. Okay, right? That There's a distinct persona, right? Or... Um, <clears throat> persona of the spirit to use the, the latin phrase that is distinct from the father and the son but is not divided from the father or the son we're trying to use language that that speaks of the three yet retains the the oneness of god because we are monotheists origin writes um and as an, an intellectual being god is worshiped in spirit and truth contrasted against material places of worship thus distinguishing he says from god from bodies and from shadows or an image and then origin he brings philosophical language into his theology specifically using negative or apophatic ascriptions of god we would call these classical designations of god we've already been kind of talking through some of these because we are expressing that you use this language that God is incomprehensible and he's immeasurable. Again, these are negative, right? In or M, right? Um, he is not comprehensible. He's incomprehensible. He's not measurable. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't contrast those. There's comprehensible and incomprehensible, right? So one's the positive, one's the negative. <coughs> Excuse me. And Origin says, God is many degrees far better than what we perceive him to be. Now, I would say that many degrees, um, I don't think that's an appropriate term. Um, I don't think a lot of the later theologians would say that, but again, he's trying to work his theology out. I mean, really, if he's if he's incomprehensible and he's immeasurable, I wouldn't say many degrees far better than we perceive him to be. There's a sense that we cannot perceive him as he is in his essence. <clears throat> and that's the, the kind of conundrum here is to, man, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. We're talking about having a grammar to talk about God who is incomprehensible, right? We can grasp, grasp things through revelation, but we're also trying to speak in a way that does not diminish his, his majesty, his glory, who he is, um, but also in a manner that we can speak in God, about God in terms that we can relate with and understand with and understand what he's trying to tell us in his word. Um, and so back to, back to our point here. So to explain about the many degrees kind of thing, Origen uses an illustration of a creature's ability to see a spark compared to the brightness of the sun. He says, when speaking of the differences between God and man by degree, 
His intention, by use of the spark and sun analogy, is to demonstrate the difference between God as having an intellectual nature and a creature having a bodily nature. Excuse me. So when we think of intellectual, there really is no um, space limiting. There's nothing, nothing materially limiting intellectual nature, but those of a bodily nature in the world that we're in. Okay, that's what we are. We do have um, um, a threshold, a limit to what we can see by our own abilities. Right? Intellectual nature is different than the bodily nature, and he's trying to explain that. So he says here, a creature can behold a spark of light. But it does not have the ability to behold the glory of the sun. And I think it's a great illustration, right? We see, think of a, of a match striking or uh, two rocks, you know, clacking together to make that spark. You can see that, but you cannot look at the sun. And I think that's a really helpful analogy. Again, it's one of the uh, common things we see in the early church fathers of using these analogies from nature to really help us grasp uh, in a way that we can understand as, as having bodily natures, right? Bodily natures. Um, the glory and, and the majesty of God. <clears throat> he goes on to say, um, God as an intellectual bodiless being, okay, the human intellect is not able to grasp or see. However, God has revealed himself in a manner that creatures can behold as the rays of the sun can be seen as they beam through a window. Again, another uh, uh, analogy from from nature that we can totally we can totally grasp that right the, we can grasp the the analogy um, but it's very true that we cannot ultimately see God in, in His glory because of, of of being bodily creatures that we are um, beings that have bodies and we cannot behold God in His immensity and who He is and again Scripture says no man can see God and live <clears throat> now the brightness of the rays that we can see reflect the glory of the source they come from, which we cannot see. Origen writes, Because our own intellect is not able to behold God as he is, it understands the Father of the universe from the beauty of his works and the comeliness of his creatures. Right. So back to Romans 1 language, 119, that the the works that we see around us, I think it's, it's Psalm 33 about the heavens declare the works of his hands. I, forgive me for that. But um, so the, the, the creation around us, when we look at beings, when we look at um, nature, when we look at the sky, the stars, everything, all of those things were intended to point us to behold the glory of God. But we can't obviously perceive and see that that true glory of God. So the creation before us is meant to point us to him and to understand that that he exists, that he has invisible attributes and his divine power and is sovereign over, over everything. Excuse me. So at this point, Origen provides a definition of God as, quote, a simple intellectual being accepting in himself no addition whatever so that he cannot be believed to have in himself a more or a less, but is in all things unity, or monos is the is the word, or if I may say, hinos, oneness. Okay, the first principle of all things is that God is simple. And that's the foundation of our doctrine of God, as far as when we're speaking of again, we're speaking of the metaphysical reality of God. Obviously, Scripture starts with creation, starts with you know God revealing Himself to to a people um, in creation. But we're talking about God in his essence, and, and the simplicity of God is a, is a bedrock doctrine that the early church fathers, uh, all with really without even wavering, held to that doctrine. Even later on, we'll get into a theologian, I um, can't remember his name right now, but he was considered one of the greatest expositors of the word, and he really was against speaking uh, about God in a speculative manner. Like he really did not like that, but he took the simplicity of God as standard. There was no argument. And simplicity is really a speculative understanding. But was, where, again, it's all about what scripture reveals about God. And so we ultimately kind of conclude that God is immutable and it takes us to the simplicity of God as being foundational to speak of the of the constitution of, of the essence of God. Whereas creatures, we are our constitutions to be composite, right? We are made of parts, God is not. And it's it's important for us because we speak of God as being triune. So simplicity 
is, is an important an important concept to grasp. Now, if, if we weren't Trinitarians and we were monadic um, believers or um, Unitarians, I don't think simplicity would really be would be something that would be you know, discussed and be a bedrock foundation. But again, we know we're monotheists, but the scriptures force us, right? They pressure us uh, in, a, in the right way to see that God, God is three. Um, so that's a, a good definition from him. So, and again, it's, it's, he's the first principle. And that's that word again that uh, we've mentioned, I think, in the beginning of our, of, our, of our lecture series, that first principle was something that we obviously, that we see that comes from Greek philosophy. Um, the philosophers utilize, but here is origin is now speaking of that and referring it to God, to the Logos. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, the, the book that we're studying from or going through that we're, we're gleaning stuff from is called um, On First Principles. And again, I'll show that book later on. But continue here. So God cannot be composite and diverse, for he necessarily exists free from all bodily admixture, right? There's no body and spirit. It's, it's completely free. He's simple. Um, he's the divine essence. He's spirit, right? So God is spirit, and he means an intellectual being, and therefore does not need space, a sphere or a body in order to move. Human beings are both body and soul, where the soul grows with the body, is limited by it, and can be hindered by its weaknesses. Now, obviously, when he thinks of the soul growing, it's not like being stretched out, but the standpoint to where the body and soul are together growing, and that, that soul that we have is the increasing in its intellectual acuity, in its maturity, in its understanding and comprehending of the things of the world. <clears throat> and also, again, there's also the weaknesses that we have in our spirits that we have to contend with because of our flesh. So, so arguing from Matthew 11:27 um, <clears throat> that God is intellectual being, thus invisible, God's invisible nature does not mean that he eludes or escapes the gaze of frailer creatures, frailer creatures, <laughs> but because by nature it is impossible for him to be seen, right? Our eyes cannot perceive uh, the divine essence. <clears throat> so again, nothing eludes us, right? Nothing escapes us. We cannot see the divine essence. We can't see God as he is. That's why he came in the person of Christ. Origen says it's only proper of bodied creatures to be seen, whereas being seen cannot be predicated either of the Father or the Son, because the scripture tells us no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Excuse me. So the Son's revealing of himself and or of the or the Father is it's not a physical scene as bodies are seen. Rather, it's a spiritual revealing phenomenon of participating in divinity through the eyes of the heart. And this is a really good point because when we think about the New Testament, Christ came to his own and they rejected him, right? They rejected him. Why? Because they could not see through the eyes of their heart who the Son truly is and who he was revealing. And we see later on, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. So Origen, having come to the end of his discussion regarding the nature of God, he moves on to explore the divinity, I'm sorry, the divine nature of Christ in his human nature, which, quote, in the last times he took on account of the economy. We've been using that word economy, right? That the, how God reveals himself in redemptive history, that the economy of God, the outworking of, of, of the three persons uh, manifested in time and space. As observed in Tertullian, um, or Tert, remember we call him Tert, <laughs> observed in Tertullian, Origen follows the normal pattern of, be of beginning with Christ as the begotten wisdom or word of God. Now I say normal pattern because the common starting point of Christology and explication of the triunity of God in much of the early church fathers was with the identity of Christ as the Logos in John 1.1 1, 1, and the wisdom and power of God that we see in 1 Corinthians 1.24. Those are used quite a bit. Also, even in Psalm uh, 8, speaking of the, of the wisdom of, of Christ as well. So in, in making the connection between the Old Testament with the let there be divine fiat passages in Genesis 1, and then God's act of speaking the world into existence as we see in Psalm 33, okay, so I remember Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9, to the Logos, through whom all things were created, right? John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 15 through 16, Hebrews 1, 3. 
So, and it says, let me continue here, the, the analogy of the intellectual reality of God as mind, thought, and utterance function as a helpful approach to explaining the divine economy. And if you recall from the last lecture going through Tertullian, uh, he really kind of brought that out, which we see used later on by um, later fathers, kind of building off that work, and we see it also uh, very well known in, in Augustine. So, so dismissing the idea of God being without his wisdom, even though we speak of the Son, who was indeed born of him and derives from him what he is, nevertheless, we speak of what is beyond the limits of what we can understand. Again, that's why we're referring to these analogies. That's why the early church fathers constantly did that, because they knew that creation... Our language, what we see around us, how things work and function, the structures of things, um, the patterns of things, all point to God. And so we, we, are, we are creaturely beings that see in a certain manner of, of the world. So God is giving us as keys, as indicators, as decoder rings, if you will, right? A way of looking and understanding uh, the God of this world. <clears throat> um but when God decided to manifest his wisdom, to utter his word as observed in creation, right? We talked about Psalm 33. We are to understand when Solomon says, quote, She was created the beginning of the ways of God, that wisdom is containing within herself the beginning and the reasons and the species of the entire creation. So the idea here is, let me go to slide six. Um, am I in the right slides? Okay. Oh, that's what I just read, right? Um, sorry, I lost track of myself. That's coming up later. But okay, so I'll, I'll read a little bit more here, then I'll kind of explain a little more. So, so Origen further interprets this view of the word as wisdom, the beginning of the ways of God, not as the word wisdom as having been created at some time. Again, it is foolish to think that God was without his wisdom at some time. And this is what like Jehovah's Witnesses will constantly go to uh, Proverbs 8 to speak of wisdom as personified as a as a woman, right? And and they'll see that, you know, when that's referred to Christ, they'll say, if that's the wisdom, it says that, he says here that what? The beginning of the ways, right? Or she was created, uh, the beginning of the ways of God. We have to understand this, that what he's saying here is that the word discloses all that is to come to exist from the wisdom of God, his mind containing all the secrets in mysteries of God, thereby she is called the Word, because she is, as it were, the interpreter of the secrets of the intellect. So when we're talking about, you know, wisdom, the beginning of the ways of God, right, the wisdom kind of creating, it's not that wisdom is brought into existence. It's that as the Word, as he utters the Word forth, obviously I'm using creaturely motions here, as he utters the Word the words, the power of the word in revelation and creation is manifesting, right? Manifesting the wisdom of God. The wisdom comes out, is made known by the word of God. And that's how we are to understand it. And that's how the early church fathers, um, you know, uh, understood that as well. Um, so, and in the words, disclosing the secrets and mysteries of God, he is also, as scripture tells us, the truth in the life, John 14, 6, right? Now, arguing from what is obviously rational, Origen remarks that which is living can only come from that which is life, and for such things to truly exist, the source of all that is must also be true, having been derived from the truth, right? So he says, how could rational beings exist unless the word or reason preceded them? Um, I got a little footnote here that I, I put up here in the block, but um, it's kind of a little side note thing. But uh, I have here, um, interestingly, Origen's understanding of the Trinity as it relates to creation and creatures. He says that all rational beings are partakers of the word of God, that is reason, right? Logic, reason, wisdom, the word, that kind of thing. And in this way, as it were, bear certain seeds implanted within them of wisdom and justice, which is Christ. The Spirit, however, is the work of grace and works in those who are already walking with the Son and the Father. So you see this distinction that 
is that grace that the Spirit is given to us as a as a matter through God's grace. So so we have in a sense so wisdom and justice is given to us through the creation of through through Christ's act of creating the word the logos right, but the Spirit is the work of grace. For those who are already walking with the Son of the, and the Father, now I would say that he kind of seems like he he moves the um, the work of the Spirit to be to kind of follow regeneration. I mean, I'm not really sure. It kind of seems that way, uh, but he doesn't really kind of elaborate on it. Um, but obviously, we know that those who belong to the Father and the Son have been given the gift of the Spirit. Right? The Spirit now dwells in our hearts. God now indwells creatures in a manner by grace, whereas before. Um, God is omnipresent by His essence. All right, so there's a there's a distinction there. He says all of humanity, without distinction, participates with the Father and the Son by the by the manner of being created. Right, that we know that unbelievers, the Spirit of God does not dwell with them, but creatures participate. Okay, participate in a manner with the Father and the Son. Um, as creatures in God's world, right? God sustain the God, the Father, God, the Son, sustain all things by the word of his power. They uphold creatures. They um, obviously, now we're never going to say that the spirit is not with the Father and the Son. Obviously, um, God is one, but that special grace of the spirit does not dwell in those who are not of the Father and the Son, but of, of humanity as a whole. That's that's what I'm understanding him to, to say. And I'm trying to kind of maybe correct some things that I, I see that someone could kind of think that he's saying, but he's not saying. But he says, uh, but only those who are holy, okay, participate in the Holy Spirit. And then Origen points to 1 Corinthians 12, 3, where Paul writes, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And um, that's a very uh, popular verse for speaking of, you know, regeneration precedes faith. So it's only by the Spirit can I confirm and affirm and confess that Christ is Lord. And I say, obviously, there's some different, um, different, you know, the, the context maybe of that passage isn't per se to speak about that, but it still points to a, a truth that we know that, okay? Um, and then he says, so how, how, does, how does one attain God? He says, first, they are from the Father. Second, they are from the Word as rational beings. Third, they become holy by the Spirit, becoming capable of Christ anew. All right, back from my footnote into the main main body of the lecture. So, then again, Origen's purpose is to explore and explain the divine economy of God. So far, he has placed pegs, right? Play pegs on aspects that we can grasp. Now. He moves deeper into the recesses of God to understand how the Son is the offspring of the Father, yet there, there's not been a time when the Son did not exist. Now, it was a, a heresy that was brought in through Arianism, where the classic phrase is that there was a time when the Son was not. And so that's something that he's also kind of dealing with because, again, he, he's trying to understand the economy of God, that the Son has always been with God, but now he's made known uh, through revelation, whereas in times past we didn't know about the sun. So the question is, was the sun always there? Well, if the sun is God, and God's always been, then the sun also has to have always been. So he's kind of working through that. Um, he writes, however, as he as he humbly and honorably observes, he says it is abom abominable and unlawful to equate the generation of the sun from the father as the same kind of generation found in humans and animals, right? As humans procreate, right? Man and woman, husband and wife come together, produce a child, and then they, what? They um, produce an offspring. So now we have a child is generated, human generation, from the man and the woman, ultimately coming from the wife, <clears throat> for the mom. So he says here, the father's generating of the son is something exceptional and worthy of God, for which can be found no comparison at all, not merely in things, but even in thought or imagination, such that a human mind could not comprehend. And it is one of the most, you know, deepest profound mysteries of that we say that the that the Son has always been with the Father. He, that the Father begets the Son. The Father is the ungenerate one. The Son comes from the Father, but yet there is no time. You know, time is before creation. There's no point when the when the son came from the father. So we're trying to 
we're trying to use language to speak of what has always been, but the purpose is to express the relations. It's to express the relations that there's a distinct father, a distinct son, and ultimately a spirit, and we know them by the relations, which has been revealed in redemptive history through the missions. And we'll get into that into that uh, much later on, I think, as we get into Augustine. Um, slide seven. Go back here. Okay. Um, so then, how is the son begotten from the father? Origen replies, his begetting is an eternal and everlasting begetting, just as brightness is begotten from the light. And that's, again, classic early church fathers. So, as we know, the, the, the sun emits rays, and the rays are instantaneously part of the sun. There's not a point where you have the sun burning, and then the rays come from it. It's all from the same source. And so a lot of the early church fathers, they spoke of the father as being the monarchia, as the, as the head, um, the ungenerated, the uncreated, right? Um, but mostly ungenerated, as they would say. And from the head comes forth the Son and the Spirit. And this is how the early church fathers were able to really retain um, our, our um, monotheism. Because if we say that, the, that the, the Son is ungenerate, then we have two ungenerates. Now, obviously, the Son is, with, you know, is eternal, right? But we're trying to say how we can retain the oneness of God, that we are monotheistic, right? But then we see the, the relations that come from the Father of Source. And we'll see that more in the Cappadocians later on. Um, but that's kind of, you know, uh, I think Augustine kind of moved away from that model a bit. And so that's more or less that monarchia kind of perspective has really retained more in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. <clears throat> um, okay. And Origen then concludes expressing the distinction that his sonship is by nature, not by adoption in the spirit. The nature of divinity is timelessly eternal. Again, as he said earlier, we're speaking of things that we have no idea. We cannot comprehend it, but we're we're using language, right? We're talking about the divine grammar to speak about what is incomprehensible um, in a manner that we can grasp, right? We're looking to grasp. We can never fully comprehend. We're looking to grasp. So to speak of the eternal from the temporal, we quickly realize that we are without words and concepts to clearly delineate what eternal begetting means. Now, explanations from nature, simple expressions of concept of, of complex concepts, excuse me, they must suffice. With that said, while we are confined to human language to confess the things of the divine, we have lots of room for speculation from that which we deduce from scripture and creation. So, in Christ being called the image of the invisible God, Origen wants to know how or what is meant by this term. His reasoning for doing so is so we might perceive how God is rightly called Father of His Son. Because when we think of images, right, we think of things that are painted, sculpted, or carved. Those are generally images of something, whether of something in creation or just of the mind. But the sun is the invisible image of the invisible God. Now, you may think of image, you may think of his flesh, but he's referred to as the image of the invisible God, but he's invisible, right? He makes himself known in flesh, but he's still referred to the, as the image of the invisible God. So he says, how is an image without form said to be of that which does not have form? And he references Genesis 5.3 to try to explain this. He says, um, as it says, it's been written that Adam begot Seth in his own image and form. Thus, the image preserves the unity of nature and substance of a father and of a son. So, what we see in human begetting is that the form and function is preserved in our offspring. Basically, that's what's proper to humanity, right? So, in our, in our offspring, we preserve the form and the function of what is proper to humanity. Now, Christ, as the image of God, he is the form and function of God. That means what is proper of divinity, he is preserving in the image, which is invisible. So if I'm visible as humans, right, my offspring are going to be visible. But I'm preserving 
what is proper to humanity, which is a form, which is a body, which is a human nature. So as Christ is the image of the invisible God, he is, he is um, uh, uh, preserving what is proper to that divine image, which is what? Eternality, invisibility, um, uh, simplicity, uh, 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 right? The divine essence. That's what he's preserving. So, I think it's very fascinating where, where Origen is trying to really kind of, kind of work th work this out. So he says here. So as human children do all their human fathers do according to nature, the son, as the image, likeness, and offspring of the father, likewise does all that his father does in accordance with the divine nature. So. Humans do things in accordance with their human nature, and the divinity does, does the things in accordance with the divine nature. I think it's fascinating how it explains this. With that said, Origen must move his exposition in an abstract direction to show where the parallel separates from the temporal. Remember, we're, we're making analogies, and we can never say this is exactly what it means because we still can't comprehend what that is right we cannot see the divine essence we can't even fathom that we got three pound brains so he writes by the fact that the son does all things like the father the image of the father is formed in the son who is assuredly born of him as an act of his will proceeding from the intellect remember he's an intellectual being right he's a spirit being as the son is also so the act of his will is the begetting of the Son. God produces his actions by his will, whereby the Son is the subsistence of what God wills. We said subsistence earlier is... Uh, hold on. Sorry, I got a burp coming on. Sorry about that. Um, the Son has a concrete subsistence of who he is. Right? He's not... The, he's not uh, a separate being, but there's a subsistence of the Son that shows a distinction, that shows a separate relation from the Father, from the Spirit, but that's how they're ultimately related. So, But he is the subsistence of what God wills. So what God wills, the Son brings forth, right? He's his wisdom, his wisdom and his power. So God is an intellectual being. So for the parallel to suffice, we must use language befitting of an unborn, uncreated intellectual being. So he says, the son as the word is not perceptible to the senses, since he is wisdom without body, and is also the true light who enlightens everyone. Therefore, Origen writes, the Savior is the image of the invisible God and Father. <laughs> Excuse me. So this relation and revelation is how we come to God. The son's relation to the Father, himself as wisdom, uh, light, the splendor of the glory of God as God is light, and truth reveals the Father to us as his image. Right? He's the image of the invisible God, and he reveals God's will to us. <clears throat> and this image, which cannot be perceived by the senses, is the means by which we come to a knowledge of God through the eyes of the heart, through the soul. And then Origen references Matthew eleven twenty seven again, emphasizing the knowing in contrast to the seeing, right? We we see with our eyes, but we don't see with our soul. And that's why when Christ came to his own, they rejected who he was, right? Because they saw him with their eyes, but they could not see him through the eyes of their soul or their heart, right? Um, okay, next one. Oh, let me finish that. So, so yeah, in referencing 11.27, he says, emphasizing the knowing in contrast to the seeing, the Son and the Father but only by knowing through the Son's revealing of the Father to whom he chooses, right? That's the grace, right? That's the Spirit that he reveals the Father in the Son. So we have the Trinitarian persons working as one, revealing revealing God to creatures. Slide 10. Uh, so when the Son reveals the Father, this knowing the Father is understood according to Christ, when he says, he that has seen me has seen the Father also. And he says, thus knowing is seen, right? No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and to whom he choose to reveal him. So if you've seen him and you actually see the Father also, that is the knowing. The seeing is knowing. Knowing is seen. 
sorry, yeah, knowing is seen. So Origen warns against those who speak of Christ as an emanation of God, right? Something that, that kind of comes out of him. That was kind of a, of a heretical thought, right? That, that, uh, that the sun and the spirit just kind of emanate almost like the, the rays that come from the sun. Um, and again, that's the analogy is used to describe things, but that's not really what it ultimately means. But because by doing that, it's what it says. So, um, Origen warns against those who speak of Christ as an emanation of God, so as to divide the divine nature into parts and divide the God and Father as far as they can. Now, while the specific terminology is not used, we see a nascent metaphysical understanding. So like an a initiatory metaphysical understanding of the doctrine of divine simplicity functioning as a safeguard for the divine economy. Again, God is simple. He affirms that. It can't be an emanation because now there's parts that come off of God in a sense, like droplets off a larger drop of water or a larger body of water come from it. But he, again, we're safeguarding our monotheism in the divine economy. And that's, that's, that's imperative that we do that because heresy said in we become tritheists, uh, ultimately become pagans, and it's, it's really, really nasty, right? So that was always important to safeguard the divine economy by retaining divine simplicity. So Origen is not done with the question of Christ as the express figure of God's substance or subsistence. Specifically, how might wisdom also be called the express figure of the substance of God in her revealing God to others. Now, there, uh, the her is referring to the wisdom, right? Still using that kind of personification piece. So, um, to explain, Origen offers a helpful illustration for material things, in which he looks to Philippians 2, 6, and 7, where Paul speaks of Christ, when in the form of God emptied himself, to show that Christ's display is the fullness of divinity. So he says, suppose there was a statue, a statue, like a like Statue of Liberty, right? Of such magnitude that it fills the entire world so that it could not be seen by anyone, right? So this statue is so big, you can't see it. I mean, literally, just think of a statue the size of the universe. You cannot behold the entire statue. You, you just see this kind of like this section of it, right? You, you can't even tell what it is. It's so big, right? Then he says, then another statue is created similar to this one, having the complete countenance of the magnitudinous statue, absolutely indistinguishable from it, but measurable, unlike the immeasurableness of the first statue. And so then he writes, in like manner, he says, the Son of God emptying himself of equality with the Father, right? The Father being the magnitudinous, magnitudinous statue and showing us the way by which we may know him, okay? Knowing is seen, becomes the express figure of his substance so that we who are unable to look upon the glory of the pure light, right? The, the statue that's magnitude is that we cannot even fathom what it is. We have no clue what we're looking at, right? But he says here that he's the express figure of his substance, right? So that we who are unable to look upon the glory of the pure light while it remains in the magnitude of his divinity may, by his becoming for us, the splendor. Isn't that fascinating? So then he says here, so um, how does the illustration then from the statues explain Origen's point? So he says here, and I think you're probably already tracking with me on this, the Son of God confines himself to a small body. The second statue, right, preserves every similarity to the Father as displayed in the Son's immense power and works, right? He does the works that show where he's from, right? Revealing the invisible greatness of the God and Father in him. So the first statue, the Father is in me, and I'm in the Father, right? The first statue, that's the Father, and he's the second statue. So therefore, such is the reason why Christ can say, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. I don't know what you think, but I think that's brilliant. And I, I love the example of trying to take these concepts 
in a way to, again, we're trying to grasp, right? We can't comprehend everything, but we can grasp. And I think Origin does a great point. And I, and I hope what you're hearing so far is kind of, you know, kind of in a sense making you seem like you you really see the kind of thinker that he is and where he was trying to go with this. And it's it's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So then now Origen moves on to discuss divine omnipotence, <clears throat> excuse me, being shared by the Father and the Son, by which God is referred to as Almighty. And God displays his almighty power and the Father's exercise of power over all things through his word, whereby all things become gosh, excuse me, subject to the Son and the Father in the Son's possession of all things. And Origen sees the, the culmination of this display of God's almighty power through Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, 28, and Philippians 2, 9 through 11, where the Father has put all things under subjection of the Son as demonstrated in the Son's exaltation. So all of creation, things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father when the Son then becomes subject back to the Father, so that God may be all in all. So so as we see, right, um, so the Father is the first statue, the Son is the second, embodying, right, he embodies the first in him, and then we see this now kind of being kind of the power being demonstrated through Christ, and then the Father exalts the, the second statue, right, the second statue at his right hand, and then he makes all of creation in subjection to him, to the glory of God the Father, and then the Son is then subject back to the Father so that God, God may be all and in all. So, continuing the theme of divine power, Origen ensures that this power is pure and clear, demonstrating the wisdom displayed in this act of power. The power displayed in wisdom is contrary to the power and wisdom of created things. Now, Origen's intention is to further emphasize that the power of God in subjugating creation is righteous and pure. It seems he's trying to remove any hint of tyrannical rulership in Christ's lordship. Right? He, and to buttress this point, Origen speaks of the Son of God using language and concepts of immutability and divine simplicity as unalterable and unchangeable and very good and every good quality is in him, essentially, that is, it can never be changed or altered. So we see simplicity, immutability, right? Every good quality is in him, essentially. It has to be in him. Nothing is given to him. Everything comes from him. So it's essentially in him. Like, we have wisdom given to us. We have life given to us. We have all of our gifts given to us. So, so our wisdom isn't essentially from us, but God it is. So that it can never be changed or altered. So we see the doctrine of immutability there as well. So, concluding his exploration of Christ, Origen reiterates the notion of the divine economy, writing, The primal goodness is recognized in the God and Father from whom both the Son being begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeding, without doubt, draw into themselves the nature of that goodness which exists in the source from whom the Son is born and the Spirit proceeds. So again, it's everything is, is essential and inherent in them, but ultimately they proceed from the Father, and but they ultimately point back to the essence of the Father. All right, divine impassibility. Just kind of a section on this. I don't know why I titled it impassibility. I think I came to a part and somehow just categorized for me to be about impassibility. So, um, so Origen's interpretation of Numbers twenty three nineteen in the Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint meant that God is impassable. So if you're familiar, Numbers 23, 19, where God says that he is what? Somebody finish it for me before I get to it. In 23, 19, God says what? God is not a man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act, or promise and not fulfill? We also see that in 1 Samuel 15, 29 and Hosea 11, 9. So this is kind of a key passage for uh, speaking of impassibility. So, but with Origen, claiming God rejoices and grieves, he seems to have reached a limit in his philosophical theological framework. Language about God having emotions 
must be reserved for instructing simple believers. Right? These are the things that we understand. This is the creaturely language that God has revealed to us in his word so that we can understand in a creaturely manner. Remember, we are creatures. We are bodily beings. God is an intellectual being. So things don't apply to him as they apply to us. Right? Uh, God doesn't have chemicals. He doesn't have a body. So anything where our emotions and everything, our feelings and everything is all kind of, kind of tied up in this nexus of our human, human, humanity, as being creatured, creatured beings. So, anthropomorphism is a is a common, common word in these kind of circles that gets a lot of attention. So, anthropomorphism is man morphism. So basically, it's speaking of human terms, right? Speaking human terms of God. So, so God. Ascribing to God human qualities or traits, to be more precise, so that God can relate to mankind. Again, we see in Scripture that God has nostrils, uh, that he has eyes, that he has the right arm, right? Well, obviously, this is anthropomorphic language. This is morphic man language to speak about uh, to speak about God. <clears throat> so Origen saw his this language as instructional not truly stating something real about the divine essence. This is important because in our in our modern context, we see this slippage quite a bit where people start taking the, the language of revelation for creatures and, and putting it back and projecting it back onto God. But again, if we do that, then we make God more creaturely and then God cannot be who he says he is. Now, obviously, I don't mean God cannot be, but the problem is you create a contradiction. You create... Uh, a problem with with God saying that He doesn't sleep; He's everywhere present. He knows the heart of every man. So that's that's stuff that we can't know. But then all of a sudden, if He's got a body and if He's got eyes, and He's He's we're, we're putting these kind of human qualities upon Him. We says He have wings, right? He doesn't have wings, obviously. Then we're 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 we're, we're, we're doing violence to the import to the to the purpose to the purpose of the language. And that's what He's saying here, right? It's it's instructional. It's not truly stating something real and essential about the divine essence. But to some, this language seems to have theological significance. I got a footnote here. Um, don't know why I do. doesn't matter. We'll keep moving. Um, so origin, or origin, following Ignatius, spoke of the suffering Christ. Uh, Tatian and Clement. Tatian was a, another early church father. Um, I don't really have much about him, but he's kind of referred to uh, in his writings. Excuse me. So Tatian and Clement, we've already talked about Clement. Gosh. <laughs> Sorry if you hear all my burping on this lecture. Um, they called Christ the God who suffered, right? But they were speaking of the paradox of the incarnation, who, which speaks of the divine human person of Christ, not the nature of God as God, right? The, the divine essence cannot suffer. Now, in his commentary on Matthew, Origen speaks of the paradox as a distinguishing mark of deity manifested in Christ when he writes, As a lover of men, he who was impassable suffered the emotion of pity, and not only had pity, but healed their sick, who had sicknesses diverse and of every kind arising from their wickedness. <clears throat> His comments here seem to imply that impassibility is an intrinsic aspect of God, who in the person of Jesus astonishingly is able to suffer the emotion of pity. But later in life, Origen having apparently changed his mind on impassibility, expresses in a, in a homily on Ezekiel, referring to Deuteronomy 131, that God endures our ways just as the Son of God bears our emotions. The Father himself is not impassible. That's uh, end quote. <clears throat> So, important to consider is the understanding of emotions in an ancient context compared to our modern notions of the word. In fact, emotions is a modern term which has been anachronistically forced into the ancient context. Now, you may read translations, new translations of, of ancient works, and the word emotion is going to be used, but again, how we, how we understand emotions and the purpose of it um, is not the same as was understood in the literature. I believe that the word emotion came out like in the 1800s, and it's not tied to the kind of emotions, emotion, the language that was referred to in the uh, ancient ancient uh, language, or ancient uh, uh, writings. 
So it caused a lot of confusion uh, in our modern context. Again, even the idea of a person, like when, when the Eleuther's Father were speaking of the persons of the Divine Godhead, uh, they weren't speaking of persons as we think of now, as a person being a separate, distinct being. They used it to just to make distinctions in the Godhead. That was the only reason, but modern Trinitarian theology now is persons, and now we associate being a a, um, uh, a separate consciousness, a separate, uh, what's the word? Yeah, separate, separate human consciousness or separate divine consciousness from the other divine persons. And that's not what the early church fathers nor Trinitarian theology has really understood for the majority of, of, the, of, of Christian history, <clears throat> Christian theology. Um, so Origen and others semantically extended our knowledge of God by means of revelation of God in Christ way beyond the negative concepts provided in philosophical theology. Now, philosophical theology, it provides the contours of the transcendence of God, but it lacks precision as a framework for revelation in that God's self-revelation of himself in Christ offers a knowledge of God not solely located via negativia. Now, via negativia, it's a philosophical approach to theology which asserts that no finite concepts or attributes can be adequately adequately use of God, but only negative terms. So we mentioned about uh, uh, apo uh, apophaticism and negative theology. This is just more of a Latin way of saying the same thing, via negativa. <clears throat> but, so God must have some positive, thus personal concern for mankind. Because if we just talk about via negativa and think of just all the negative things, we're just basically saying what God is not. It's All that's designed to do is to say what God is not to safeguard us from, I'm going to say, a creaturely slippage, a, pro a human projection onto God. Now, obviously, God has revealed himself in ways that relates to us, but we have to always remember that it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not a, it's not a, um, <laughs> I forgot the word. It's not univocal, okay, it's analogical. And that's important. Like, I think the great example is that the word, the word healthy can mean different ways. It can mean healthy urine, healthy food, um, healthy understanding, right? That word is not the same. Someone's healthy. Doesn't mean the same thing as a healthy understanding, but that's how we're saying there's an analogical understanding of that, of that word and, that, and how we use it. So, um, so God must have some positive, thus personal concern for mankind. However, to speak of passions in God was to make God subhuman. So affirming that God has passions seemed to only denigrate him. And that's the big error now is that the impassibility, it's a safeguard to say God does not have passions. And when we read the Bible, Paul only uses passions to speak of the flesh, right? To speak of what's corrupt. Uh, passions are never a good thing. Now, we say, may say, you know, I'm passionate about the Bible. I'm passionate about this. It's a different manner of speaking that they're referring to. And we want to make sure that God was not like the pagan gods who were passable, who were uh, lustful and tyrannical and angry and all the stuff and and selfish and that god's not that way so um so while the relationship oh did i let's see okay we're there so while the relationship between philosophy and theology has proved difficult what we find in the early fathers is that they began with the christian faith using the philosophical framework and language of their time right so the only form of philosophy they outright rejected was Epicureanism because it was materialistic, right? There was dualism is going on as well, but it was Epicureanism was that everything was material, everything was physical, and the Christian faith obviously, uh, we are as, as creatures, we are body and soul, right? We are uh, material bodies, but also have immaterial souls. Now here's a, a great quote from um, church historian Robert Grant, uh, kind of an older guy. He says here, in relation to the doctrine of God, then, what the early Christian theologians show us is that by continuing along some of the lines marked out in the New Testament, and by making more explicit use of philosophical ideas, they tried to work out some of the implications of the basic self-revelation of God, in terms adequate for their own times. They began with faith, which they interpreted philosophically as well, or two, and used philosophy as a language of interpretation because they continued to recognize that God could not be contained in the physical terminology. They remained open to fresh insights in new ways of explanation. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but and I, I think I mentioned it in the very first lecture, is that you know through all the 
the the dogmatic schisms and the and the polemics and all the debates, it was all about terminology. It was they, the church fathers realized they had to use language outside the Bible to explain what the Bible teaches. And that's where, you know, Grant here is making this insight, this observation about that. That was the battle of the search for the Christian doctrine of God is the famous title of a book by um, R.P.C. Hansen. It's a classic work, but that's the whole thing. It's, it's really the search for the doctrine of God is the search for having the grammar and language to articulate um, the glorious God of the Bible in a manner that's consistent with the Bible, but doesn't smack of paganism or creatureliness in God. <clears throat> So, to conclude, much more can be said about Origen. Uh, he's had a bad rap from theologians over the years. Uh, true, he had some aberrant views that we would not consider orthodox today, uh, but Origen was doing theology in a context that lacked consistent systematic expression, as we enjoy today, right? I've got a series of systematic theologies all along the wall, all the way down here, right? Where I, I stand, we stand on the, the giants before us and have a very systematized, developed, rigorous theology that Origen didn't have, right? He didn't have. So um, it's important that we remember that. Um, he was breaking new ground. He's a profound thinker. And it has only been recently that patristic scholars are bringing his teachings back to light with new translations of his work. So the, the book here at the end, so Origen on First Principles, uh, translated by John Baer, this came out a few years ago. I think it's it's a really, it's a reprised translation of the previous one, which John in his in his kind of you know kind of behind the scenes about it really says that he thinks that the the misunderstandings of origin was was a lot in part to those earlier translations and he thinks he's very been very faithful to to what origin has been trying to say. So again, we need to remember to refrain from judging theologians of the past according to standards of orthodoxy today. And I'm not saying that we should promote his views that do not fall in line with sound doctrine, but we should learn to glean the good and toss out the bad and that's what we want to do as theologians is is you know is get the good stuff right i mean obviously we want to have a sound a foundation of sound theology and then read these guys because if we just kind of look past if we look past the past the church will not move forward the church will continue to make these errors that we're encountering in modern theology because there's the mindset that says that anything pre-modern needs to all be tossed out. And no, that's not what we need to do as committed Christians to the word, to the to the to the the Christian historic tradition. There is many that can be forced that the Lord raised up as teachers, as gifts for the church that we want to look to and not make mistakes of the past, but also to really see um, ways that we can express our love for th for God through these ways of understanding different things. I think what we've gone through today was probably pretty fascinating for a lot of you. I know it was for me, my first time going through it, it really opened up my, you know, my, my vision of God just through some of these really basic understandings of analogies and, and some of these really, really great insights. So anyways, again, thank you for uh, joining, listening, uh, watching, and I guess I'll see you on the next lecture.